Good evening, everyone. My name is Christian McBride, and we welcome you virtually to NJPAC. Uh, I am the, um, I work in the jazz department as a jazz advisor for jazz programming in NJPAC, and we'd like to thank everyone at NJPAC uh, for this program this evening. And as always, a huge thank you to TD Bank for sponsoring jazz at NJPAC. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of the NJPAC family for, uh, this is my ninth year, and uh, everything that has happened at NJPAC uh, inside of those nine years has been some incredible uh, high-minded programs that have happened, and I think tonight's program, you will agree, um, is going to be very, very special. Um, duets on social justice, justice, jazz, and poetry, uh, or more specifically, bass and poetry. Uh, two of my, my two guests this evening are just, um, they're powerhouses. Uh, one is, well, they're, how can I say this? One of my two guests tonight is a bona fide icon, an American icon. Uh, I don't really know the words that I can say that would uh, really give justice to her importance, um, to our world of the arts, to um, giving voice to what's going on out there in the world socially. Um, and may I introduce to you this fantastic, fantastic icon, the great Nikki Giovanni. Professor Giovanni, are you there? Okay, well, while we're waiting for Miss Nikki Giovanni to come on. No, you know, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Professor Giovanni, thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you, Christian, for inviting me to be here and inviting me to share this evening with you and Evie. I am so pleased. I was listening to you this morning because I listened to a jazz station and they play an awful lot of you. And now I get to say, oh, that's my Christian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you know, I, again, I, I can't really, I'm not sure I can think of the words that could really express just how important you've been to me and to, uh, and to the entire world. So thank you so much for uh, just for who you are. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and, and it, it's wonderful. And, you know, I, as I say, I, I'm, I'm a jazz fan. And I say that to my, my students all the time that yes. if you want to learn, you know, how to write, actually, if you want to learn history, listen to jazz because That's you right. have to listen to what, 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 they, what they're putting together in a way that everybody says, oh, no, they, they won't do that. The, these people are just uh, slave ancestors or something. And right. we've continued to build the music. And we, right. we have built the music that's heard around the world. And, you know, so when, when you called, I was just, I was thrilled. I was jumping, oh, Christian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's very kind of you. I, I'd like to bring our second guest in for the evening. Uh, now, Miss Evie Shockley, um, her book called Semi-Automatic, I believe is a must read for all of you. Uh, Evie is, um, she is at Rutgers uh, right here in New Jersey. And uh, she is the uh, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award winner um, for her book, The New Black. And um, also she won the 2012 Holmes National Poetry Prize. And uh, she is just fantastic. We've worked together before as uh, I've had the great honor of working with Professor Giovanni before. But now I would like to introduce you to Professor, my friend, Evie Shockley. Evie. Hey, great to be with you, Christian. Thanks for all those kind words and such an honor to be here with you, Professor Giovanni. Oh, my, the honor is mine too. So thank you. That Hurston lost, uh, Langston Award, Langston Hughes Hurston Award is a great thing. So I'm, I'm very proud of you and, and thank you for continuing a great legacy. Thank you. I have, uh, you know, a great set of models ahead of me in this path. And uh, so we're walking it and we're going to keep walking it. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I f almost feel like I just want to step back and let you guys talk because <laughs> so much greatness on here tonight. But uh, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to get right to doing some 
let's 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 make some music. Let's make some art. Yeah. Um, yeah. Evie, would you would would you mind um, getting us started? Not at all. Would not mind. Um, I've got a poem that um, comes from the book Semi-Automatic, which uh, is dedicated to the, the three people who co-founded Black Lives Matter um, in, in one of its earlier phases. Um, and this poem is one of the centerpiece poems, I think, from that book um, for that reason. I was thinking about the losses that we have suffered from um, to, from police brutality and other, other ways that um, black people in particular, black men, black boys are um, targeted in this country. And at the same time, thinking about some of the phrases that my father used to say uh, when I was growing up, uh, when my sister and I would ask him for candy or toys or whatever we wanted. And those two, those two subjects kind of got crossed in the language of this next poem. Um, so whenever you're ready, Christian. Great. Uh, just a quick uh, disclaimer uh, to those of you who are watching, Zoom isn't exactly, uh, the, the technology of Zoom hasn't quite been uh, developed yet where we're perfectly in sync. So, you know, uh, the bass might be like point five milliseconds behind what I'm actually playing. So, but we think this is going to work uh, and I'm looking forward to this and uh, let's, let's get it started. And forgive the low production value, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I, ex I am in my basement. <laughs> but this is where I practice. It's where I listen to music. It's where I write music. This is where the sausage is made. Looks like you got a lot going on down there. <laughs> a lot going on down here. <laughs> Supply and demand. The more black boys you have, the more you want. You act like we're swimming in black boys. You can't keep black boys in your pocket. If you had a million black boys, what would you do with them? Do you think we're made of black boys? Black boys are all tied up in property. Black boys won't solve all your problems. You don't just find black boys lying in the street. It takes black boys to make black boys. Most people don't know how to save black boys. Boys don't grow on trees. Oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a hard poem, but you know, it also uh, gets a little play with language in there to spark spark thought and that's what the poetry that I write is trying to do. Evie, mm -hmm. no, thank as you. The of black country, yeah. No, no please, I, I have go a ahead. It's old now, but uh, you do, you worry about your black boys and every mm -hmm. time they leave the house and you can't tell them don't leave the house because then you, you're, you're preventing them from growing though they don't grow right. <laughs> on trees. But as Billy Halliday said to us, southern trees grow a strange fruit. There you go. That's yeah. the history that this poem is trying to, to write itself into. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the history of 
commodification of black people also plays into the way as I was thinking about how we are valued and how we are devalued, right? Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Evie, for that, that very powerful work. Um, Professor Giovanni, uh, when I think of people like uh, John Coltrane, you think of a song that he's written that has become a standard like Giant Steps or A Love Supreme. Oh. You think of uh, Dizzy Gillespie, you think of uh, Groovin' High or Salt Peanuts or something like that. Or Miles <laughs> Davis with So What, you know, uh, Mary Lou Williams with the Zodiac Suite or something like that. Um, I think of Ego Tripping as your standard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, um, I, you know, you're one of those people who like, you know, when people ask, like, how, how did you first become aware of uh, someone like yourself? When I think of uh, Nikki Giovanni or Gwendolyn Brooks or Miri Baraka or, or James Brown or, or uh, Nat King Cole, I don't even remember because it feels like you've always been there. You know, um, I, I thank God that I have a family that's been so deeply entrenched in teaching me about black history from the time I was a kid. So, I mean, they probably said your name to me when I was a baby and it just kind of, it just got <laughs> stuck there, you know? Um, but I, you know, I, I, I grew up with you and um, the ego tripping uh, from, you know, the reason I like chocolate is uh, that's, that's something I heard very, very early in life. So uh, it would mean the world to me if we could do that right now. Let's try it. Let's let's try ego tripping. Woo! Yeah. What kind of groove would you like? It bops along, so bum 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 bum. It's a happy poem because we're creating something. I walked to the front of Crescent and built a space. I designed a pyramid so tough that a star only glows every 100 years falls into the center, giving divine perfect life after that head. I sat on the throne drinking nectar with a log. I got hot and sent an ice age for Europe to cook my thirst. My older scooter is snapped repeated. The tears my birth pains created the Nile. I am a beautiful woman. I gazed on the forest and burned out the Sahara Desert. With a pack of goat's meat and a change of clothes, I crossed it in two hours. I am so skipped. So skipped. Can't catch me. For a birthday present, when he was three, I gave my son Hannibal an elephant. He gave me Rome for Mother's Day. My strength rose ever on. My son Noah built more, and I stood proudly at the helm as we stayed on a soft summer day. I turned myself into my September speech, then intoned my loving name, who praises, all oh, praises. I am the one who saved. I sold diamonds in my backyard. My bowel was delivering the radium. The violence from my fingernails are similar precious. On a bit north, the current cold and blew my nose, giving oil to the Arab world. I am so different. Even my Arabs are correct. I sailed west to reach deep and had ground on the earth as I went. The hair from my head bent and hope was laid across the country continents. I am so hip, so ethereal, so surreal. I cannot be comprehended except I'm a mission. I mean, I fly like a bird in the sky. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Thank you. <laughs> Love it. I can't fun. remember the first time I encountered that poem. Wow. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank what, you. what a what a thrill that was. <laughs> that was fun. But you know. 
it's always one of those things. And I'm sure Evie, you think of it too. If I were creating the world, what would I, what would I start with? Exactly. And of course, for me, as we looked at the uh, ego trip and I would start with the black woman, but yeah. now that I'm an old lady, I would start with rain. I would mm. start with water yes. because where can you go without water? And so it's really funny how you learn things. But there's a, Christian, I'm sure you're, you're aware of it. There's a book called The Jazz of Physics. And what yes. he's saying, he's an MIT professor. And what he's saying is that the universe was started by sound. And I'm listening to you. And as that has come, if we hear that hit, hitting against each other, we are going to get the earth. We're going to get, something's going to come out of something living. is going right. to come out. I think it's so wonderful. I wow. love that. Different sources of life, right? I have uh, a couple of things I wanted to ask the both of you. Uh, you both are from the South and um, you both love jazz. I kind of want to get into the South and I want to get into jazz and how that relates to what you do. Um, Professor Giovanni, uh, Actually, you, you both grew up in, in Tennessee, correct? I, I, I did. did. Yep. <laughs> Nashville and Knoxville, oh, if I'm remembering correctly. Nashville, they're right down the street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so t if you could, I, I mean, I don't know how you can say this in, in short, but um, tell me about each of your version of, of Tennessee from when you grew up. Well, wow. I had a sense to know that Memphis wasn't a part of Tennessee. Memphis mm. is a part of Mississippi. So I never had to worry. <laughs> it's true. You know it too. Mm. But I went to college. My college was Fisk University. So I spent some time um, in Nashville. And as we know, Knoxville is a part of the Appalachian Trail. And so right. Knoxville is going to be a part of the trail that's going to fight against the South. Tennessee, as, as we know, Evie can tell you too, it was the only state that fought. They did fight with the South, but they were the only ones that did not have to go undergo uh, reconstruction because we recognized that Tennessee was, was uh, an important part of, of what we were, of what the South was, of what the North was going to do, which is why we, we are in there in, in the North. But we, the music, of course, let me say that a little, so make, a, make your sentence, Nikki. The music, of course, is Fisk University. Yes. And we look at we, we look at Ella Shepard, who was an incredible woman. And it was Miss Shepard who, when Fisk was, was going bankrupt, went to General Fisk to say, how can we help? And General Fisk, like a lot of dumb people, said, I don't think there's anything you can do. What can you do? And she said, we can sing. If you had been there, Christian, you would have said, I can play the bass. Right. If he had been there, you would have said, I can write a poem. Yeah. But a lot of people would have ignored that. They would have said, that's nothing. But Miss Shepard had enough sense not to listen to fools. So <laughs> she took, <laughs> it's always a good idea. And she could take her group, the Fisk Singers, and took them around to try to raise money for Fisk. Ultimately, she ended up in Wilberforce, Ohio, where the brother of uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe heard them and said to Ella, if your group comes to New York, which is where he was, I will give you, you will make money. And when she came to New York with the Fifth Singers, there was a man there. He was a, a, a Lord, 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 uh, uh, Lord Nottingham. And he said, my cousin should hear you. And his cousin, of course, was Queen Victoria. And they went to London and it was so wonderful. They stayed the year. And people like to say Queen Victoria gave them 50,000 pounds, which she did not give. If you've been around that many white people, you know that they earned it. <laughs> Every right. day they earned yeah. it. And right. It saved, right. it did, it saved uh, Fisk University. Mm -hmm. And I am so incredibly proud to say, of course, that Fisk won the last night, night before now. Fisk won a, a Grammy. And I'm so glad because they have been deserving a Grammy for, for right quite on. a while. Yeah. And, yeah. and I also want to give a, uh, a shout out to uh, the radio station at, at Fisk University, one of the finest jazz radio stations in the country. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I mean, so I'm just sitting here thinking about all of the history that um, Professor Giovanni just spun out for us. When I think about growing up in Tennessee and in Nashville in particular with, uh, with jazz and music in general, you know, I think about what it meant to be a black person growing up in sort of the country music uh, city capital of the world as it was at that time. Um, but how much my life was filled with um, jazz and R&B and the particular kinds of sounds that um, came out of uh, the church that I grew up in. We had congregational singing as opposed to a choir. So, so there's such a blend of musics that, that I grew up with, but my father um, uh, plays jazz, plays saxophone and uh, clarinet and, um, and he had Coltrane going in, in the house. He had Duke Ellington, he had um, Johnny Griffin, he, Miles Davis. These were sort of the, the tunes that, that I grew up hearing, not always knowing the names. I wasn't, um, I of course was into the Jackson Five, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the sounds of, you know, things like Night in Tunisia were in my blood just because they were ever present uh, in our house. And so, um, and so I feel like music is just something I absorbed and something that I had to actually learn not to take for granted. Um, there have been moments uh, over the course of the years where I've been able to tap into the histories that the music charts for us um, from the spirituals, through the blues, through jazz, through um, gospel, R&B, hip hop. It's, you, can, you can in fact teach yourself the history of this country and certainly the history of black people um, just by listening to the music. And I think the same thing can be said of poetry, which is how I teach it often. Right, right. How, how difficult is it? I'm sorry, were we saying professor? No, uh, you... If you don't mind, I, one other thing I should have mentioned. In the days that Ella Shepard and the Fisk singers, they were Fisk singers then, were in England, you didn't talk to the queen. The queen sat on her throne and you did what you were doing. But Victoria leaned down at one point and said to the fist singers, where are you from? And Evie, you'll love that. And Evie said, and, and, and excuse me, uh, 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 <laughs> and the shepherd said, yeah. uh, Nashville, ma'am, because that's the way you refer to them. And Queen Victoria said, why that must be a musical city. And that's why <laughs> Nashville is called, I just wanted to remind everybody, the reason Nashville is called Music City is because the fifth singers went to England and Queen Victoria said, why that must be a musical city. That's amazing. I don't think that's I've ever heard that story. That's fine. That's the truth, yeah. yeah. Wow, Fabulous. dig that. No knowledge being dropped right here, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to ask you both a question about, uh, about poetry. It, has it been difficult to sort of, when, when you see young people coming up, we live in a culture of uh, celebrity and capitalism, and everybody wants to have a shiny position making a lot of money doing something that you can see on TV or on social media. You both have become these, these masters at this art form known as poetry. Um, how do you get a young person to understand the power, the power of poetry, like it is for us trying to get young people to get into jazz. I mean, in some ways, I think rap music has uh, opened the door mm -hmm. that, that young people come up through listening to rap and, and freestyling themselves and, and making rhymes. And so at a certain point, spoken word and slam scenes have have kind of, I mean, beginning with the black arts movement, it must be said, right. although I'm not gonna talk about the black arts movement with Professor Giovanni here, but um, you know, that, that moment, the last poets um, and the, all the people who were writing and, and 
performing with music, with jazz um, in that, that moment till the present. I think, I think that bridge is open and, 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 I, and I think young people want to walk across it. I think, I think people have in this time in particular where uh, we are in the midst of a, another political awakening, young people see the power of words and the power of art to um, sustain us, to inspire us, and to, um, to allow us to imagine what we want, just like the, the ego tripping poem, like imagine the world you want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Professor well, we well, Nikki, and we haven't mentioned one of the most important names, and that's Nina Simone. Yes. And we have to remember at the when 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 we crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge, I went to school with John Lewis. And of course they cracked his head open the first time. The yeah. second time when they crossed that bridge, Nina was there among other people. And she yeah. sat down at a piano, which was not her usual, you know, great piano, just a little cracked up piano. And she said, Mississippi, goddamn. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You can say what you have to say. And we forget that Nina carried a lot of people with her yes. in terms of the yes. music and the poetry. She put right. a lot of things together that people were saying, you can't do that. And she was like, I'm Nina Simone. I can do what I want to do. <laughs> right, right. She didn't yeah. win a lot of awards either. She didn't, you know, nobody, a, a lot of people didn't appreciate Nina. But Nina did that one thing that I think any, uh, she was a friend, by the way, and I miss her. But I think she did the one thing that anybody would do. She realized that she didn't care. If they didn't appreciate her, that was their loss. And she went on. And she, she was a wonderful, and you know that too, because she had a great, uh, the mixture. She had a great voice, and then she could, she, had, she was a great pianist, as you know. Yes. And, you know, it was just so wonderful to listen to her make little little girl blue, and then she's going to turn into, you know, she, 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 the way she thought. Right. And she thought like a poet. She put things together that nobody did. It was a great loss, lo lo losing Nina. Yeah. Uh, was a great loss. She was yeah. a very creative person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you say I, I, I can't call you Nikki. I'll, I'll do my best. But <laughs> um, prof, how, how about Professor Nikki? Can I, can I do oh. that? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, I, I was, uh, I had the great honor of working with you um, about ten years ago. Uh, we did a tribute concert to uh, Don Pullen. Right. And um, you were mentioning that you, you guys lived across the street from each other. Right. But that entire neighborhood, will you tell us, like, all the people that lived in your neighborhood at that time? That was a great, really, it was a great neighborhood. Next door was Morgan Freeman <laughs> and his first wife. <laughs> and that was really, and, and she was, Jeannie was a lovely person, and we all liked her. Across the street was Don Pullen. And Don was sharing a, 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 an apartment at that point with Milton Graves. And you wow. remember Milton. Yes. And all, of us had, all of us had a crush on Milton. So we finally realized what we had to do was get Milton married so that we could go on about our business. <laughs> <laughs> we found a wife for him and, and he moved on out. <laughs> and I left. But down the street, of course, was uh, Gregory Hines, who was a, a dancer. Um, oh, God, my, my mind is going, will it go around in circles? Will it? Billy Preston. Ooh, Billy Preston lived down yeah. the street. If you wanted to see Sydney Portier, there was a little restaurant called uh, right, right on the corner there. And Sydney was a friend of the owner. And so if you ever needed to see Sydney or just wanted to see him or whatever, you could go over. Sydney's a nice guy. You could go over and, and, and say hi. You know, the, the neighborhood was really, I guess it was maybe cheap rent or something, but we were all there <laughs> for, for the longest. We were all there together. And I think we all cheered. Yeah. I don't think, I know we all cheered for each other. And that was good because whenever anybody was doing something, the rest of us supported it. So when I had my first really big book party, my book uh, launch, uh, Morgan was there and Morgan read some poetry for us, which he didn't wow. have to do, you know, I couldn't have afforded it. And he, he was just beginning to, 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 to be Morgan Freeman. And his good friend was Novella Nelson who was a wonderful, wonderful woman. And Novella said, oh, she'd come. And we all kept, we were a group, we were a community. Yeah. And 
I, I, I think we still have a bit of a community, but I think that there's a little less love than should be. <laughs> I don't, I'm not saying that uh, badly. I, I think that we, we need to care a little bit more about mm. each other. And I really appreciate what Black Lives Matter has done because my generation was the generation of civic civil rights. We, we wanted the civil rights and uh, they were important to, to get rid of segregation and things were important. But Black Lives Matter, as we know, has become and is global. Yes. They, they have taken what they had globally. So they took the next step. And I think that that's what's so incredible that what, what is the old song? We all know that we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Mm. Every round goes higher and higher. And yes. the Black Lives Matter took that one, have, have taken it one more step. So it's really wonderful to see what those three young women have done. And you might say, well, they're still shooting people. Yes, they are. And I'm not, I'm not blind and I'm not crazy, but we have taken, we, we have taken the world looks right. now at what is going on. And if you look at what's going on in England right now, the British women are now doing what the black women did. The British women are complaining about the death because a, a, a young white woman was murdered. And right. they're saying, we're not taking it anymore. We're just not gonna take it. And they're out, they're out doing black lives, doing a black lives matter. Right. And, and I think that black lives, the, the, those youngsters must be so proud of themselves that they open the door that everybody's walking through. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, indeed it is. Yes. Such those powerful. Doors keep opening. That's right. Yeah. Um, Evie, would you uh, would you tell us about the second poem you you brought? Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, actually, this is a it's a great moment to segue to it because yeah, a lot of the 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 comments that that Nikki just made were helping us to see the connections between one generation and the next or between a, a national fight and more global, sort of the more global implications of it, right? Um, this poem that, um, that I'm gonna read next is one of the poems that I, uh, that I wrote to focus us on the connections between issues that are often thought of as separate. To, to get us to, to think about the interconnections between all kinds of um, challenges and problems that we're facing. And um, because I think the solutions are equally interconnected. Um, this poem sort of makes the centerpiece um, issue, the issue of immigration. Um, we are a country of immigrants, or so we yes. are told, voluntary and involuntary, as they say. Um, if you if you can speak of a, a of an involuntary immigrant, right? But um, this poem asks us to to question the myths and the narratives that we tell ourselves or that we are told about who we are and and how we can fix or or address even the problems that we're facing. So I think that's uh, that's enough to get us get us into it. Let's do it. I, I, I've been inspired to even pull my bow out, if you don't mind. I do not. Give you, give you some long tones. Oh, I have to remind myself to keep reading. I just want to listen to you, Christian. <laughs> and I want to congratulate you. Speaking of Grammys, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you, my friend. It was, uh, it was just, it was an honor to be able to work with Chick Corea all those years. You know, and, and share that Grammy with him, and uh, may his legacy live forever. Indeed. Anti-immigration. The Black people left and took with them their furious hurricanes and their fire-breathing rap songs melting the polar ice caps. They left behind the mining jobs, 
But take that nasty black lung disease and the insurance regulations that loop around everything concerning health and care, giant holes of text, all the coverage falls through. The brown people left and took with them the pesticides collecting like a sheen on the skins of fruit. They went packing and packed off with them went all the miserable low paying gigs, the pre-dawn commutes, the children with expensive special needs and the hard up public schools that tried to meet them. The brown people left, railroaded into carting off those tests that keep your average bright young student outside the leagues of ivory lined classrooms and also hauled off their concentrated campuses, their great expectations, their invasive technology, and the outrageous pay gap between a company's CEO and its not quite full-time workers. They took their fragile, endangered pandas and their species extinction and got the hell out of Dodge. The black people left and took HIV AIDS and the rest of their plagues and all that deviant sexuality with them. They took their beat down matriarchies and endless teen pregnancies too. Those monster size extended families, the brown people took those. The brown people boxed up their turbans and suspicious sheet-like coverings, their terrifying gun violence, cluster bombs and drones, and took a whole bloody mess with them. They took war and religious browbeating, tucked under their robes. They took theocracy and their cruel, unusual punishments right back where they came from. Finally, the white people left, as serenely unburdened as when they arrived, sailing off from Plymouth Rock with nothing in their hands but a recipe for cranberry sauce, a bit of corn seed, and the dream of a better life. There were only certain kinds of people here after the exodus left to wander the underdeveloped wilderness in search of buffalo, tobacco, and potable water, following old migratory patterns that would have been better left alone. Thank oh, you for that, Christian. Oh, wow, was, Christian. I wonder if I might give another. I know that we don't have it planned like that, but what Evie said, I've done almost the opposite with, because they left. But I did a poem called "Those Who Stay Behind." You want you want to do that? Can Can I do that? <laughs> please. Can Can I play? <laughs> oh, please do. Yeah. It's just a, and it's not correcting you. It's just another way of looking at it. Absolutely. But some of us stayed. Yes. I wait, I wait to you. Some of us stayed. We forget the strength of those who stayed behind. We sometimes don't recognize what it took to decide to build a church, a school, a school to sell the yams we picked up the ground. The tomatoes we carefully watch turn red on the vines. The speaker overpied the scrubbers to pick. We took pride in our work and lovingly encouraged our daughters to dream. We sent them, our daughters, to school them, to college, 
and they stayed to help others. 100 years, it's not so long when we plant love with faith. When we find that song that gives us them. Yes. I like yeah. the way that, that our poems went together because yeah, but some of us stayed. And I was recently asked uh, what, you know, what name one of the important uh, uh, quotes. And there are a lot of important quotes, ain't I a woman and stuff. I said, I think the most important quote in my generation is Dar He. When Moses, yeah. Wright, when Moses Wright stood up and said, Dar He. Right. It started a revolution. Nobody gives Moses credit, yeah. but that was, that was important. We know that that King could speak. We know that 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 uh, uh, Douglas was a good speaker. We, we know a lot of that. But it was Mose Wright who stood up at the risk of his life. But nonetheless, he stood up and said, "Darhi." Darhi. Yeah. Dar mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh I my goodness, it. this is uh, this has just been so wonderful. I um I, I know we only have. Uh, we only have a few more minutes and I know that we have some uh, questions from uh, some of our viewers uh, tonight. And uh, if you don't mind, um, sorry for uh, cutting you off, Professor Shockley, but uh, did you did you want to say something before we got to the cues? Oh, man, just just to comment on the the way that these poems work together and the uh, just the the kind of variety of ways that we can think about calling attention to the issues and imagining the, the sort of the ways to, to tackle these problems. I mean, my poem is, is not an advocacy poem. I'm not saying we ought to leave. It's, it's just using that, that idea of sort of unraveling the way this country was made to, to ask us to think about, you know, uh, what, what do we have together and what could we have if we could live together and work together um, that, that we don't have when we splinter ourselves in these ways? And Nikki's poem comes at that from a, a different angle, a, a angle of building and, and growing things. I, I, I just love the, the kind of work that this, um, that this that art does. I, I guess I wanna, I'll put a quote um, that I love to refer to uh, out there as well. And, and this is from Tony K. Bombara, who, who said, you know, something, and this is a paraphrase, but, you know, as a member of an oppressed group, my job as a cultural worker is to make revolution irresistible. Mm. <laughs> and that's what I think this work is doing. Yeah, dig that. That's yeah. beautiful. Oh, that's uh, let's see. Uh, we, go, we have a question from, uh, let's go to Karen Hudson. Uh, her question is, other than the social justice correlation between jazz and poetry, what, if any, are other similarities between jazz and poetry that you can think of? Many, right? <laughs> I mean, music in language and music on the uh, on the string, so to speak, or in in the in the air. But um, that idea of wanting to to um, sort of chronicle the way chronicle our lives, I think that those are those are pursued in poetry and in jazz, improvisation. I think. Mm -hmm. Being able to to mix it up in the moment is one of the the connections I see. But I wanted to say a couple of words first because I know that that you two will have a lot more to say about no, about but, that. But I am a, a a monk fan, and and I guess everybody is if you can hear, you know. And what I've always loved that he said. Somebody said, you know. Mr. Monk, you know, there was an interview, you know, you, you play these strange notes and they don't go together. And Monk was sitting down, he just looked up and he said, the piano ain't got no wrong notes. Right, right. That's and right. I, I, I've always loved Monk for that. And I think the jazz has helped our community know we don't have any wrong notes. We, 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 we're not, nothing is gonna go wrong. We, what we're doing is always gonna be the best thing. 
And I, as, as you're saying, Ethan, I think that's what's important. Yeah. Wow. That's 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 very beautiful. Um, Francis Conwell asked uh, sisters Giovanni and Shockley, what was the most challenging poem that you wrote? <laughs> I couldn't begin <laughs> to answer that. Uh, I, 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 you learn things and you write about them. Uh, I don't, and I'm not uh, trying to tell anybody what to do or how to do it. So I don't think I have challenges in my poetry. I have. I, I love some of them. Some of them are not as good as others. I'm not a fool, and, but I still like them. You know, it's like, oh, well, that poem didn't work and I put it in the book anyway. But I, I don't, uh, I think that what she's asking, I cannot answer. That, that's that's a long way of, of saying that I, I cannot. Huh, I, you know, it, it is an interesting question um, to, to try to single out a specific poem that that's most challenging. I, I would say the next poem is always <laughs> the most challenging. You, every time you sit down to the blank page, um, especially when you sit down with an idea of something that you want to address, but you have to find your way from, uh, you know, what you might say is a speech to a work of art. <laughs> that is the challenge every time and, um, and and so, you know, I, I think the poem that I'm working on now, whenever I say this, is the, is the hardest poem. I'd like to ask you both a question about the creative process because uh, it, this happened to me, well, it happens often, but this happened to me recently. I got commissioned to write a piece um, for the Temple University Jazz Ensemble. And I, I was writing this piece and I got halfway through the, the ideas were coming and, you know, everything was going nice and smooth. And all of a sudden, just bam, I hit a wall and I just I could not think of anything. And I mean, like um, I woke my wife up in the middle of the night like I can't think of nothing, <laughs> you know. Um, Finally, it, it took maybe three or four days. And then all of a sudden, you know, I just heard something and boom you know, it, it started to come out again. But how often does that happen to you both if it's happened? And when it does, what do you do? Mm. Well, I mean, I will say that a lot of times I'm doing that work kind of in my head before I sit down to write. Um, so I try to avoid running into the wall because I wait to write until I've, I've gotten there. But that's not always the case. And, and I think one of the things that I do, and I, I feel like I ran into a, a kind of a, a brick wall of months during this past year. Mm -hmm. um, I've you know, spoken about this before, just it felt impossible to write in the face of everything, loss and the possibility of loss and uh, just all of it. And, one of the things that I do is I turn to the work that's already out there. I listen to Monk or I listen to Christian McBride or I listen, or I read the, the, the poets who have inspired me so, you know, often and so well. I'm, you know, the names that have come up for me over the course of this evening, thinking about Fisk, Robert Hayden, um, you mentioned Gwendolyn Brooks, who's one of my favorites. Um, and, and, and I think about the, the community of poets in which I write today. Um, and those are the places that I go for, um, I guess, for the, the spark that will help me leap over um, the, the hurdle of the blank, the blank screen, the, the you know, the, the failure to know exactly where to go next usually the answer is, is, is in the, the work that we already have and that, that we, the, and, and, in the, and in the community itself. I just wanted to say that because um, Nikki mentioned earlier the importance of community. And um, one of the things that has kept me going through this, this year is uh, the community, a, co a small collective of poets um, that, we formed, uh, it's a group of five of us 
called Poets at the End of the World. And, and we developed our group just for the purpose of connecting poetry and social justice. Um, but one of the things that we've found over this year when there weren't as many ways to, to read and, and you know, sort of uh, fundraise for some of the groups that we want to, to fundraise for, we found that just talking to each other and sharing work and um, comparing notes about life was helping to keep us going and helping to keep us creating. So um, that's, that's my long-winded answer. Yeah, that's a wonderful answer. I, I guess I'm the only person on earth who has enjoyed this year. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody said, you know, it was really hard. And I asked my students because I am still teaching, I'm enjoying it. We were talking about loneliness and they were saying they were lonely. And I thought if I'm gonna ask my students to write a poem about loneliness, I should write a poem about loneliness. And I sat down to write a poem and I realized I'm not lonely. Uh, as a writer, first of all, I'm used to my own company. And secondly, I have enough sense to know, which I did with that poem, the, the part of it that I had, when it's not working, tear it up, throw it away. Because if you leave it sitting on your desk, you'll keep thinking, I should do something with it. And then you'll start feeling guilty. Oh, I'm failure, I'm a failure. No, just tear it up, throw it away and get yourself, I would suggest wine, but other people drink beer and go on about your business. And Christian, I, I'm glad that I'm not married to you because if you had come to me and say that, I would say, you can't be crazy. Go, go get a beer and shut up. <laughs> uh, you you can rest it. assured that that kind of happened. Yeah, <laughs> it's the best thing because otherwise you're picking on yourself. Right. And the person who asked that question, you have to be careful not to pick on yourself. Not to say, I should write this really brilliant poem today, right now, five minutes. Just, if it's not coming, let it go. Right. I've got a rabbit, by the way, who lives with me. And I had been seeing her last year, and, and I say her, and I think it's her because I saw baby rabbits. And I thought, <laughs> oh, I wonder if she's going to come back. I have a, I only have two acres, so I don't have that much room, but I was wondering. And as I got ready to back out, because I went to get a glass of coffee, as you can see, I'm drinking a, a, a cup of I saw her and I am so pleased. Now I may never be able to write a poem about my rabbit, mm. but I'm so pleased because I'm not picking on myself and the things that I love have come back and the poems will come back. The birds, I have a little wren that comes and she lives on, on, my, on my porch, she lives in the birdhouse. She'll come back. The words will come back if you let them, if you don't pick on yourself the words will come back. If you can't do anything else, cook. Cooking is very, very, oh, it, it makes you feel, you know, you just, you liberate it. You just go in your kitchen and cook <laughs> and something will come out. And if it's not edible, throw it away. <laughs> right, there, there yeah. you go. Yeah, That's so beautiful. Don't pick on yourself. Um, this actually is a really great lead up to uh, one of the questions from an anonymous attendee. Uh, says, can any of you talk about the importance of the physical space you create in? How you've built spaces that are conducive to your creative work. Being confined to my home during this pandemic, I've thought so much about the importance of, uh, of your place in art making. Yeah, for me, this where you see is where I work. And I this I do miss. And if I'm trying to get something done, this is where I'm going to come because this is where, where I'm, I'm comfortable. And it's got everything. You can see how messy it is. And what you can't see is, is how the music comes in. But I've got, I live in a museum and my bedroom is a, uh, I get teased about that, but my bedroom is like a farce because I've got, home. my mother died uh, 13 years ago now. And I kept the, the flowers. I kept the, the vines from the flowers that were sent. And they, they've continued to live. So I have them in my bedroom. So my bedroom is, is a forest and this is a museum. So if I'm not comfortable and happy and loved here, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow, you know, um, 
So the, the spaces of art, I, you know, I have to say that um, I am an introvert. And so this year has not been all bad, uh, but, uh, but I, I think I get a lot of work done in my little uh, study office space. It's, uh, it's a book lined room that, um, that, you know, that has all of the, the, the people who I like to read and my computer is usually set up there. That's, that's the space that I do a lot of my writing, but that it's always kind of the second layer because my first drafts are always longhand uh, and then I type them in. And so that's me and my notebook and that can happen almost anywhere. I have a comfy chair. I really miss writing in coffee shops. I like that sort of background hum um, to, to write to, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a, there's a, a sense that I have, picked up over the years that you a poet has to kind of be ready to write when the words come and so I'm that person who carries a notebook and a pen yeah. and, and might write almost anywhere yeah oh and and you you see my basement this is where this is where everything happens I got my electric piano over there uh got my upright bass here my electric bass there records and books surrounding me so uh it's, it's hard for me to come out of the basement. <laughs> um, but before we before we close it out, um, uh, Nikki, you have a, your, your most recent book. Uh, you you told me about this poem that you wanted to do, which is the uh, it's the title of your new book, correct? Make yeah, me rain. Make me rain. Yeah. If I and, could be anything, yeah. If I could be something else beside a black woman, that would be my first choice. My second choice would be rain because rain can make anything happen. It can, it can freeze, it can be on your tongue, it can be snow, rain can do everything, but mostly it's always there. Make yeah. me rain, turn me, I'm gonna wait because uh, I, I really, and, and I do, this is a love poem in, in, many, in many, many ways because uh, it's what anybody would want to do. Make me rain. Turn me into a snowflake. Let me rest on your stomach. Make me a piece of ice so I can cool you. Let me be the cloud that embraces you on the quilt that gets you dry. Snuggle close. Listen to me sing on the windowsill. Make me rain on you. Beautiful. Oh, I love it. I, I really do. Because there's nothing like it. I still don't know why. You know, we all of the winter storms have names, but the uh, the, the, the the summer storms don't. They're just like it's going to be a storm tomorrow. And I think there there should be a name for that. I like I love that because if you rain, you can be anything all the time for the person you love, and that's what you want to be. Yeah. Well. I can't thank the both of you enough for this uh, wonderful, wonderful evening of uh, poetry and uh, inspiration and, and knowledge. And jazz. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you guys are so beautiful. I thank you so much. Evie Shockley, Nikki Giovanni, the best to the both of you. And I look forward to the time we can be together in person. Yes. And uh, and we can do this for real on a stage somewhere. It Anytime. must happen. That's Anytime. right. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you who tuned in this evening. And uh, thanks to NJ Pack and TD Bank for making this evening happen. And uh, we will see you all very, very soon. Please take care of yourselves and each other. Till next time. Peace. Thanks.